Okay, so here I am at a beautiful uh, a carnivorous plant nursery located in Sonoma County. And I normally I, I like to take you out the habitat, but uh, many of these plants, uh, and there's many uh, completely unrelated taxa of uh, plants that have adopted the carnivorous habit. habit. Uh, many of these plants are just too rare or they're from such weird, extreme, uh, remote locations, uh, many in Australia, Southeast Asia, etc., that uh, to go to habitat would be impossible. But here we go. I'll give you a quick, uh, quick banger intro. This is, uh, of course, our, uh, our North American native Saracenia flava. You got a bunch of different hybrids right here. Okay, same species, Saracenia flava, Saracenia flava, Saracenia flava. Now, the interesting thing about these, these are in Saracenia ACA. Uh, that is in, uh, that is in the uh, Eric, Eric, Eric excuse me, the Eric Kelly's is the order. Same, that's the same order as blueberries and uh, manzanitas, etc. Uh, Eric Kelly's is the order, Saracenia ACA is the family, and Saracenia flava is the uh, species. There's about seven or eight different species of Saracenia in a genus, uh, in the genus Saracenia, but I want to I want to take you show you some quick stuff about the flowers here. Okay, now the flowers are extremely uh, extremely odd. Right there, you see those little yellow things in there. Those are the anthers. Those are the male parts. And then of course the stigma uh, is right. If you could see it right there, it's that. See that little horn poking off? That's the female part. That's the stigma. And you have a uh, umbelliform pistil. So this whole little uh, upside down umbrella looking thing is the uh, also part of the female part it's the pistil remember on female flowers it goes a uh, style stigma ovary uh, those three parts uh, are what basically make the the pistil the pistil is the conglomeration of all those three parts and then of course for the male parts you got pollen anther filament uh, the pollen of course are the little micro microscopic uh, almost microscopic uh, uh, particles that go on the anthers and the anthers of course are attached to the filament so anyway you got these flowers right here and uh, th the way it works is a bee crawls in there and uh, can only get in once these these petals are out can only get in to where the nectar is which is down there he can only get in this way and in doing so he brushes up against that stigma right there and leaves some pollen on it and then uh, to prevent, this is the very interesting thing about these flowers, to prevent uh, self-pollination, so they don't self, you know, so you get more genetic diversity, uh, this, they can only get out this way, they, they cannot, they cannot get out because that petal right there, uh, it prevents them from leaving out this way, this, this red petal directs them to the exit, and they crawl out that way, so that they do not brush against that stigma again with the pollen that they just picked up from inside that flower. And another thing, so he's got this fridge full of plants right here, and you might be asking why he's got a bunch of plants in a fridge, and I, I have to tell you that it's because uh, all these plants here are from higher elevation areas in South America, so they need cool temperatures. Uh, you know, they have the same uh, nitrogen deficiencies and generally very acidic waterlogged soil as uh, many of the plants out here, except they're from uh, high elevation tropical South America, especially these uh, Helianthras, which are in that same family as the Saracenias, uh, the Saraceniaceae. These Helianthras are from a type of habitat called the Tapui habitat, which are basically these 3,000 foot tall uh, geologic islands in the jungle with a, a climate up on top of the Tapuis, much different from the surrounding lowland areas. Now this is, you get the Tapuis in Guyana and you get them in Venezuela, uh, basically northern South America, closer to the equator. And uh, again, this is uh, Saraceniaceae, is the family, same family as Saracenia, what I just showed you over there, but uh, different genus, genus, and this is Helianthra. And I forget how many taxa there are total, maybe uh, maybe 26 or 27, but uh, there's only two from the lowlands, okay? The rest of the species are all from the top of the Tapui habitat, which uh, I severely suggest you look up because uh, they're pretty fascinating. Down here, of course, you got a Drosera, the Sundews. This is a completely different family from this. This is Saraceniaceae, this is Droseraceae, and this is in the order Karyophyllales. Again, it's the same order as cacti, spinach, and beets. So this guy right here, especially this Drosera magnifica, and this was only discovered within the last two or three years, and it's interesting how it was discovered. It was actually discovered via Facebook. 
some guy who studies orchids went to the habitat where this occurs which is one single mountain in brazil uh, took photographs of it he was there to photograph mostly orchids got some photographs of this which can get upwards of three or four feet tall but tends to be scandent and leans on other plants but it still gets three or four feet tall took some pictures of this and then another guy who studies the drosseras seen these in the pictures and said that's a new species where did you find that they went and checked it out indeed it was a new species boom that's drosera magnifica and again that's drosseraceae and it's a it's what you call convergent evolution completely unrelated to these but uh, developed the same uh, habit of acquiring nitrogen and other uh, nutrients uh, from the bodies of the canyon now speaking of drosteras in the same family you have many of these uh, tiny drosteras and these are all from western australia uh, there's a whole uh, I don't know if you call it a subfamily, but there's a whole section of the clad uh, that's experienced a lot of diversity in Western Australia, and many of them are extremely tiny, as you can see. And many of these uh, have the ability to go completely dormant as well. But uh, again, they are they're perennials, so they come back. They can uh, tough it out and basically go into a state of dormancy when conditions uh, dry up a little bit. And then uh, once the rains come back, they uh, pop right back out again and do their thing. And these, are, these of course, are all in the genus Drosera, Droseraceae, order Caryophyllales. Look at some of these guys. All using the same general method of putting a sugary substitute, a sugary, uh, sugary nectar on your on your leaves and then of course having these trichomes these sticky trichomes in glands that then get uh, your nitrogen source the bugs to uh, show up and get stuck so that you can digest them with your enzymes look at these scorpioid ones Those scorpioid leaves now here's another one. Uh, this looks like a Drosera, but it's not. Uh, this is a Biblis. And uh, these again are from Australia, but uh, they're not even closely related to uh, to the sundews over here, even though they look like they utilize, I mean they do utilize the same method of trapping insects. These uh, Biblis are in the order Lamiales, the Salvia order, same as uh, the Pinguicula, which I'll show you in a minute. But, uh, and again, these are Australian. This is Biblis gigantia. I had to see this, though, because that flower does not look zygomorphic. And most things in Lamiales have a zygomorphic flower. That's a bilaterally symmetrical flower as opposed to a radial flower. Look at that. They got tons of bugs in there. Now this genus is Pinguicula, and I think I showed you some of these in the last video I had uh, some of these from Habitat. These are what you call the sun, uh, no not sundews, are they sundews? Butterworts they call them, excuse me, I've never used common names so I don't know uh, what the uh, colloquial term is for these. But Pinguiculas are in the same order as that last plant I showed you, the Lamiales. And you can see these do have a bilateral flower. It's aka a zygomorphic flower as opposed to a radial. It's like a heart. You can only cut it one way and have it be symmetrical. Uh, not sure how many species of pinguicula there are, but there's a lot, and they're from uh, they're endemic to everywhere, basically, except Antarctica, Asia, uh, South America, North America, Mexico. You got one here in California. Got a native one, and they tend to like shade, but uh, they use the same similar method to that Drosera of uh, collecting insects. As you can, you basically get them to to land on there. You get them to land on there and then they stick and they die. And then you secrete some enzymes and you eat them nice. Look at that guy. Now would you believe it or not, this bastard's a, a, an insect eater too. He's a bromeliad. He's one of the few uh, genera of uh, carnivorous bromeliads. This is Bokinia and this is Hectioides. Again, this is South America. I mean, all, all bromeliads are from the Americas. But uh, what, what he does basically is he gets the bugs to go on in there. And uh, a lot of bromeliads collect water, especially in the, the lowland areas, the rainforest, etc., the jungles. They collect water uh, in the center of their uh, rosettes. But uh, this guy actually eats the bugs. 
he, he does uh, indeed secrete digestive enzymes that uh, aid him in obtaining uh, nitrogen from the bodies of decaying insects. And again, that's Bo Bokinia hectic. Here's the flowers on that uh, Helianthera. Remember, that's in the Cer Saraceni ACA. These are those Tapui ones I was mentioning. And these grow in areas where you can get upwards of 50 feet to 90 feet of rain a year. That's 50 feet, not 50 inches, 50, 50 goddamn feet. And so uh, a lot of them have these, uh, basically these mechanisms, because they would otherwise overflow with water, a lot of them have these mechanisms to uh, basically, so they don't overflow, just dump the water out the side, you know? So the way you, the way you dump your water out without getting rid of all the juice in there too is uh, you can see they're fused. This, uh, this whole, uh, basically this, what is it, a, a leaf is fused at the top, but then if you look down in there, there's a little area, this can't really show you on the camera here, not, it's not too easy. There's a little area down there where it again opens up, where it's not fused, and so water uh, can, can basically leak out. It can get to the top, fill up, but then it'll leak out the bottom so it's not getting rid of all the dead bugs and stuff that it's trying to eat down there. All right, th there you go. There's a better illustration. See how they got the hole about halfway up so they can dump out all their water when they're overflowing from the high range uh, that, of course, occur in the uh, regions where these grow. They can dump all their water out without overflowing because if they overflow, they lose all their nutrients and juice too. You know, all the good stuff, that, the little slurry of dead bug paste that's way deep down in that little... Uh, that little void. And lastly, I'll end this short little ditty by talking about this genus Nepenthes, which is endemic mostly to the southeast, uh, southeast Asia, uh, let's see, I believe uh, the Seychelles Islands, some, some of the, basically the whole area around the, the oceans, the Indian Ocean and the west, southwestern Pacific. And this genus Nepenthes uh, basically has these, uh, they're pitcher plants, but they're in no way related to the, to the North American pitcher plants. The Saraceni ACA. Uh, these are in their completely own family and order. And uh, here's a very interesting one. Uh, this is Nepenthes uh, lowii. And this guy, what he does is he uh, secretes this nectar up there to get a shrew that also occurs in the area where this guy grows uh, to nibble on the little sugar right there. And this is just the perfect length of a shrew. And when he, that shrew nibbles on the sugar right there, he takes a shit, I shit you not, inside that pitcher which then serves as the nitrogen source for this plant. And this uh, is a very woody pitcher, unlike uh, some of the other species that uh, just trap insects. This is a very woody and strong, structurally sound, structurally strong pitcher, because uh, it's got to be able to support the weight of that shrew, which is much more than just the weight of a little pitcher with some dead bugs and uh, juice in it. Now here's another genus in Nepenthes right here. And this is called a peristome, this lip basically. And a peristomes vary from species to species uh, throughout all 170 separate species that are in this genus. This guy right here is Nepenthes hamata. And he's got probably one of the most remarkable, and he's, of course, again, one of the most sought after among carnivorous plant enthusiasts. And you can see why. I mean, just look at that. Looks like a very uh, dentate uh, vaginal opening right there. Very beautiful. Okay, and here we go. Here's another notable species of Nepenthes, Nepenthes elbow marginata, and it's this one uh, has a, a, this white uh, margin on the peristome uh, to attract what's often its main prey species, termites. This white stuff is composed of this papery-like substance, uh, of course, uh, highly sought after by termites since they, they eat wood, cellulose, and lignin, and uh, the, attracts the termites there, and uh, they hang out on the little peristome, and then, of course, some of them inevitably end up falling down in there, uh, serving as the nitrogen source for this uh, this juicy, delicate bastard. Uh, the thing to, to mention here, too, is this peristome, I don't know if you could see, but uh, and it's like this in many of the insectivorous species of uh, Nepenthes. Uh, because of the structure of it, it's got these basically what look like little ridges, uh, and those, when they're dry, are no problem for a bug to crawl around on. And uh, when they're wet, they, of course, serve as a perfect uh, trap door. Uh, it's just too slippery. The bug falls in there. So, and that benefits the plant. You don't want to be successful all the time because you want other insects to go and spread the word through their chemical signaling or just their mere presence on uh, the peristome. You want other insects 
to be able to make it out alive so that they can then attract more of their friends. It's a very devious mechanism for attracting these guys. And then, of course, uh, when, and it's, when it's wet, which is at least half the time since these grow in the jungle, in the hot, humid jungle, the termites uh, just can't hang out in there. They fall right in, and boom, they're digested. So here right here is a Nepenthes vogeli uh, from Borneo. And you can see perfectly, if I can uh, hold this camera a little bit close, you can see that ridging that I'm talking about on this peristome on that lip. And uh, again, that's when, it, when it's dry, it's very easy for insects to crawl around on there, no problem. And uh, then when it's wet, it acts just like a fucking water slide, and they just they can't uh, they can't maintain a grip, and they fall right in there, making for an easy meal. And what attracts the ants here in the first place? It's a good question. Up here on the lid, uh, which very often serves as the attracting mechanism in uh, this genus, this lid uh, has nectaries on it, which produce a nectar. And that's the whole reason that the, the ants are there in the first place. So they hang out, they crawl around that lid. If it's dry, uh, a few of them make it out. They tell it our friends, you know, obviously through uh, chemical signals. And uh, you get more of them hanging out there. And then, you know, you get a afternoon rainstorm or something or just really good humidity. And uh, this peristome becomes a trap, uh, basically a trap door. It becomes a trap door when it's wet. And they fall right down in there, acting as an easy nitrogen source.